Christopher Wallace, also known as the Notorious Big or Biggie Smalls, is remembered as the larger-than-life rapper and lyrical genius who took the industry by storm. Biggie was among the few rappers who dominated the hip-hop industry in the 90s. That is, until he met his tragic death in 1997. These were the last 24 hours of the Notorious Big, the death of Biggie Smalls. In the months leading up to the murder of the Notorious Big, tensions within the rap community were at an all-time high. The East Coast-West Coast rivalry had reached a boiling point with the death of Tupac Shakur. Tupac Shakur has died six days after he was wounded in a drive-by shooting. Fans had held a vigil outside his Las Vegas hospital. As the feud escalated, the spotlight turned to Biggie, and he found himself in the crosshairs of a dangerous and volatile environment. And since there was wide speculation that the murder was a result of the ongoing hip-hop feud, Tupac's associates sought revenge for his death. Biggie, already a target of people's wrath, found himself under increased scrutiny and pressure. Rumors and speculation swirled, with some accusing him of being directly involved in Tupac's murder. The tension between the two camps was palpable, and the atmosphere was charged with hostility. In the months following Tupac's death, the notorious Big faced numerous threats and warnings. He received death threats, both directly and through his associates, heightening the sense of danger that surrounded him. Despite the threats, Wallace continued to perform and promote his music, refusing to to back down in the face of adversity. As the calendar turned to 1997, the stakes grew even higher. He even did a radio interview where he spoke about hiring security because he feared for his safety. He traveled to LA to shoot the video for its lead single, Hypnotize, in February 1997, and stuck around for the Soul Train Music Awards, sitting for interviews in which he expressed sadness at Shakur's death. Despite his efforts at peacemaking, the LA music crowd gave the bad boy contingent a cool reception when they appeared on stage at the March 8th awards show, with Wallace stepping forward to booing when he announced Tony Braxton as the winner of Best R&B and Soul Single. He was now a few hours away from his final moments. After the disastrous award show, Biggie headed back to his room at the Westwood Marquis Hotel. With an originally planned trip to Europe canceled, Wallace found himself with little to do. Itching to get out and have some fun, the rapper convinced his boys to head to an industry party at the Peterson Automotive Museum in the Miracle Mile District, which was co-sponsored by Vibe Magazine. As Puff Daddy later recounted, attending a Jones party on the outskirts of Beverly Hills seemed a safe enough move, and for a while, everyone was having a good time at the party. Unbeknownst to the party goers, several known gang members had managed to infiltrate the guest list. Despite this, the general vibe at the party was good. The rapper drank Dom Perignon with his crew and soaked in the adulation alongside fellow artists like Aaliyah and Missy Elliott as the speakers pounded out his new single, Hypnotize, every now and then. However, the venue soon became a little too cramped, and at around 12.30 a.m., the party was shut down by the fire department. Disappointed, Biggie and Puff trickled out with the rest of the party goers, pausing to pose for pictures before cranking up a car stereo to blast some tracks from his album, Life After Death. Soon it was time to head back to their hotel. Puff jumped into the first of three cars with three of his bodyguards. On the other hand, Biggie settled into the front passenger seat of the second, a green GMC Suburban, next to his driver, Gregory G. Money Young, with two more friends in the back. As Biggie and his entourage headed back to the Westwood Marquis Hotel, Puff's lead SUV promptly blew through a yellow light, leaving Biggie and the rest idling at the intersection of Wilshire Bleavite and Fairfax Ave. Suddenly, a white Toyota Land Cruiser made a U-turn and tried to squeeze in the space behind the green Suburban. A dark Chevy Impala pulled up next to Biggie. The driver, a man in a blue suit and a bow tie, made eye contact with the rapper before reaching over and emptying his automatic pistol at the car. The shots were fired mere yards from the crowd outside the museum, and amid the commotion, the shooter's vehicle sped off on Wilshire. When the shots rang out, Puff jumped out of his SUV and raced across the street to the green suburban where he found his friend hunched over his tongue out and bleeding on the dashboard the driver of biggie's vehicle floored it to the nearby cedar sinai medical center where six people managed to lift the almost 400 pound wrapper onto a gurney and send him in for emergency surgery but despite the quick medical attention the four bullets had already done their fatal damage and 24 year old wallace was pronounced dead at 1 15 a.m Chris Wallace, better known as Notorious B.I.G., was gunned down in a drive-by shooting at 12.04 a.m. Pacific time Sunday morning. Biggie was rushed to Cedar sinai Medical Center, where he was pronounced dead. Those were Biggie's last 24 hours. According to the report, three of the four shots were not fatal. The first bullet hit his left forearm and traveled down to his wrist. The second hit him in the back, missing all vital organs, and exited through his left shoulder. And the third hit his left thigh and exited through his inner thigh. The fourth bullet was fatal, entering through his right hip and striking several vital organs 
including his colon, liver, heart, and the upper lobe of his left lung, before stopping in his left shoulder area. The news of his untimely demise spread like wildfire. The rap world has been shaken again, this time by the violent death of the performer known as Notorious B.I.G. And fans around the world mourned the loss of a true legend. Law enforcement agencies launched an investigation into the murder, but progress was slow, and the case quickly became shrouded in mystery. The lack of concrete leads and the complex web of rumors and theories surrounding the murder made it difficult to uncover the truth. The Los Angeles Times reported this week the notorious B.I.G. may have been killed by Southside Compton Crips. One theory that gained significant traction was the involvement of corrupt police officers. It was alleged that members of the Los Angeles Police Department were somehow connected to the murder, possibly as part of a larger conspiracy. These claims were fueled by the striking similarities between the murders of Biggie and Tupac Shakur, leading many to believe that there was a larger plot at play. Details of this case play out like a Hollywood movie. Rapper Tupac Shakur is gunned down in September of 1996. Six months later, rapper Notorious B.I.G. is shot to death in Los Angeles. Both Biggie and Tupac gunned down in their prime within months of each other. It may involve a long rumored rap feud said to be going on between Death Row Records and Bad Boy Entertainment. Apart from that, a few years later, more evidence surfaced pointing towards the LAPD's connection to the murder. In 2002, Randall Sullivan released a book, Labyrinth, compiling evidence by retired LAPD detective Russell Poole regarding the murders of Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur. Suge Knight was accused of conspiring with David Mack, an LAPD officer and alleged death row security employee, to murder Biggie Smalls to make his and Shakur's death appear to be the result of a bi-coastal rap rivalry. Sullivan believed Amir Muhammad, who also goes by the name Harry Billups and was an associate of Mack's, was the shooter based on evidence provided by an anonymous informant and his resemblance to the facial composite over the years. That's him right there. That's him. Yeah. That's him. That's the guy that came up to me. Various investigations and lawsuits have been launched in an attempt to uncover the truth behind the murder of the notorious Big. In 2005, the Wallace family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Los Angeles, accusing the LAPD of covering up the involvement of its officers in the murder. The case shed light on the deep-rooted suspicions surrounding the investigation, but ultimately ended in dismissal. In 2006, ex-cop Greg Kading was brought into the fold to investigate Tupac and Biggie's murder. Greg Kading is an author and former law Los Angeles Police Department detective and is popularly known for working on a multi-law enforcement task force that investigated the murders of Tupac and Biggie. According to him, he had solved the murders in three years by way of a recorded confession and an understanding of the basic street arithmetic that continues to nonsensically send black men to their graves. However, making an arrest became complicated and ultimately not viable in the American judicial system. In fact, Kading had to tell Biggie's mother, Valletta Wallace, that no arrests would be made relating to the murder of her son, which which was devastating for her. According to the ex-cop, the LAPD had just gotten out of a massive lawsuit regarding the case and didn't want any more energy or time spent on it. The LAPD weren't going to pursue the case anymore. They knew that we had solved it. They were out from underneath this massive lawsuit and they were not going to waste any more time and energy on it. Tears started to well in my eyes and I just walked out of the office and went home. I'd been on the case for three years. I couldn't accept it, Kading later said in an interview. Kading's efforts did not completely go down the drain as 27 years after the tragic death of Tupac, an arrest was made. On September 29, 2023, Dwayne Keith Davis, alias Kiffy D, was taken into custody by Las Vegas Metropolitan Police. Breaking news just into CNN, Las Vegas police have arrested a suspect in connection with the 1996 drive-by shooting death of legendary rapper Tupac Shakur. Hey Keith, Metro Police, come over here. Hey Metro Police, come over here, all right? Thanks buddy. Come on over here. Appreciate your cooperation, okay? In connection with the murder of Tupac and Kading had a lot to do with it. In 2009, he helped get a confession out of Keefe D. And we put an ironclad case against him, approach him, and say, here's the deal, Keefe D, we have questions about these murders. If you don't cooperate, you're going to prison for the rest of your life, and so are several members of your family who are caught up in your drug organization. Keefe D went on to expose that his nephew, Orlando Anderson, had fired the shots that killed Tupac. Keefe D would now be charged for aiding and abetting in the murder. Another theory that has come to light in recent times involves someone who was close to Biggie and was with him during his last 24 hours. This was none other than Puff's former bodyguard, Gene Deal. Gene Deal, who was part of Puff's security detail in the 90s, has opened up about the night Biggie was killed in interviews and 
expressed his frustration at how the events leading to his death are portrayed in movies and documentaries. Contrary to popular opinion, Deal insisted that the Brooklyn rapper's untimely demise technically wasn't the result of a drive-by, as he believes the killer was already lurking in wait prior to pulling the trigger. Apart from that, his recollection of the events leading up to the tragic incident points an accusing finger at Puff Daddy. Gene also revealed in interviews that he had intel that they would be shot at that night, intel that he even shared with his boss, who dismissed his claim. Before we left Andre Harrell's house, Puff told me I didn't have to go. Now I went because I knew that somebody was going to die that night. Somebody was going to get shot. I did everything in my power to stop it from being Puff, and it wasn't Puff. According to Gene, Biggie didn't have a problem beefing with anyone in the industry, maybe because it would raise his status in the game. However, Diddy was different. He didn't want smoke with anyone, maybe because the violence would have been bad for business, especially since he was now running his own label. So he set up Biggie and let his enemies have at it. Big started that beef. Puff ain't want none of that beef. So what I'm going to do is, y'all want the sheep? I'm going to put them out the pasture. Catch them if you can. If you the wolf in, if you got that wolf in you, catch him if you can. Despite the lack of resolution, the legacy of the notorious Big lives on. His music continues to inspire and influence countless artists, and his impact on the rap industry cannot be overstated. So how exactly did Biggie get himself entangled in all these that people wanted him dead? Well, it is important to start from the very top. The Rise of Biggie Smalls to understand Biggie's last 24 hours, it is important that we explore his dominance in the industry throughout the better part of the 90s, as well as the hip-hop rivalry that ultimately led to his demise in 1997. In order to understand the incredible journey of Biggie Smalls, we must first delve into his early life and upbringing. Born and raised in the tough neighborhood of Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, New York, Christopher Wallace faced numerous challenges from a young age. Growing up in the 1980s, Biggie Smalls witnessed the harsh realities of inner-city life. His mother, Valletta Wallace, worked as a preschool teacher, while his father, Selwyn George Latour, was a welder and politician. However, Biggie's dad was largely absent from his life as he left the family when Biggie was only two years old, which forced his mom to work multiple jobs to support the family. With his father absent and no male authority in his life, young Biggie found himself involved in the dangerous world of drug dealing. According to the rapper in interviews later in life, he began dealing drugs at about age 12. His mother, often at work, first learned of this during his adulthood. Despite the hardships, Biggie Smalls found solace in music. As a teenager, Biggie Smalls began to explore his own musical talents. He would often freestyle with his friends as well as entertain people on the streets of Brooklyn. Before adopting the name that is now known worldwide, he first adopted the stage name MCC West. Just as he was sharpening his lyrical skills in the streets, music career was put on hold. At age 17 in 1989, Biggie dropped out of high school and became more involved in crime. The same year, he found himself at loggerheads with the law on weapons charges in Brooklyn and was sentenced to five years probation. The following year, he was a arrested on a violation of his probation. Biggie continued making bad decisions until he spent nine months behind bars in North Carolina after he was arrested and charged for dealing crack cocaine. Despite his involvement in illegal activities, he never lost sight of his passion for music. Once he was out of jail, he continued to write lyrics and hone his craft, using his experiences on the streets as inspiration for his gritty and authentic storytelling. He even rebranded and during this time he adopted the stage name Biggie Small, inspired by a character from the 1975 film Let's Do It Again. He went on to make a demo tape, Microphone Murderer, which caught the attention of local DJ Mr. C, who recognized his raw talent and introduced him to the world of hip-hop. DJ Mr. C promoted the tape, which was later heard by the Source Rap Magazine's editor in 1992. This was the beginning of Biggie's rise in the hip-hop scene. The Source column, Unsigned Hype, dedicated to airing promising rappers, even featured Biggie, which gave him even more exposure as it led to a meeting that would change the rapper's life forever. The tape's exposure meant that it was only a matter of time until it found its way into the hands of music executives, and true to that, it landed into the hands of one Sean Love Combs, alias Puff Daddy, who would become a pivotal figure in Biggie Small's career. At the time, Puff worked at Uptown Records in the Artists and Repertoire Division, which is responsible for scouting and overseeing the artistic development of recording artists. Upon hearing the demo tape, Puff arranged to meet Biggie, who ended up signing for Uptown Records in 1992. One year after Biggie's signing, Uptown fired Puff, who a week later launched Bad Boy Records, which soon also became Biggie's new home. With the support of Puff Daddy and his newly formed label, Bad Boy Records, Biggie Smalls released his debut album, Ready to Die, in 1994. The album was an instant success, featuring hit singles such as Juicy and Big Papa. Biggie Smalls' distinct voice, combined with his vivid storytelling, resonated with audiences and propelled him to stardom. The album showcased his unique flow and lyrical prowess, earning him recognition within the industry. However, with fame came a new set of challenges. Biggie Smalls' success attracted the attention of rival gangs and individuals 
individuals seeking to exploit his newfound wealth. The first ever encounter with goons because of his newfound position in the music industry came in 1995 when performing in Sacramento. When his group arrived at the venue, there weren't many people there. When he started performing, the crowd started tossing coins at him. When they left the venue, there was more danger waiting for him in the parking lot. The rapper and his entourage were held at gunpoint in the venue's parking lot by goons, allegedly sent by fellow rapper E-40. As it turns out, the rapper was angry about an interview Biggie had done with a Canadian magazine. When asked to rank a handful of artists on a scale from 1 to 10, Biggie gave E-40 a zero, which was obviously taken as disrespect. However, Biggie got on the phone with E-40 to plead his case. According to Biggie, the Canadian magazine had gotten him drunk and also got him to say anything. Luckily, E-40 told his men to stand down and safely escorted Biggie and his entourage to the airport. This was the first time Biggie encountered a direct physical threat because of hip-hop rivalry, and it certainly wouldn't be his last, as he would soon find himself embroiled in a dangerous feud between the East Coast and West Coast rap scenes, particularly with rapper Tupac Shakur. Biggie Small's rise to fame was not without controversy. His lyrics often depicted the harsh realities of street life, including violence, drugs, and misogyny. Critics accused him of glorifying a dangerous lifestyle, while others praised his authenticity and ability to shed light on the struggles of marginalized communities. Despite the controversy surrounding him, Biggie Small's impact on the rap scene went beyond his music. He was a pioneer in the genre, introducing a new wave of storytelling and lyrical prowess. His ability to paint vivid pictures with his words and create complex narratives set him apart from his peers. Biggie Small's influence extended beyond the East Coast rap scene. His collaborations with other rap legends showcased his versatility and solidified his status as a sought-after collaborator. His distinct voice and delivery became instantly recognizable, and his influence can still be heard in the music of today's artists. In addition to his musical contributions, Biggie Smalls also made a significant impact on the fashion world. His larger-than-life persona and signature style, which often included designer suits, fedoras, and gold chains, became iconic. He effortlessly blended streetwear with high fashion, setting trends and inspiring a generation of artists and fans alike. However, as Biggie Smalls' star continued to rise, so did the tensions between the East Coast and West Coast rap scenes. The rivalry between him and Tupac Shakur escalated, fueled by diss tracks and public feuds. The tragic deaths of both artists sent shockwaves through the music industry and further intensified the divide between the coasts. Despite the controversies and rivalries, Biggie Smalls remained dedicated to his craft. He continued to push boundaries and experiment with his sound, exploring different genres and collaborating with artists from various backgrounds. His versatility and willingness to take risks solidified his status as a true innovator in the rap game. However, while his encounter with Puff was a blessing and helped propel him into the music industry, it also cost him a friend in Tupac as well as his life. Bad Boy vs. Death Row the lead up to Biggie's death can be traced back to the beef between Bad Boy Records and Death Row Records, which was also just a part of an even bigger feud that had been playing out in the industry. In the mid 1990s, the hip hop world was divided by a fierce rivalry between the East Coast and West Coast scene. The tension between these two coasts had been simmering for years, fueled by a sense of regional pride and competition. But it was the beef between Bad Boy Records and Death Row Records that would take this rivalry to a whole new level. To understand the origins of this feud, we need to go back to the early days of hip hop. Hip-hop music and culture is widely considered to have originated on the East Coast, specifically in New York City. The East Coast rappers, with their gritty lyrics and boom-bap beats, were often perceived as feeling superior to other regional hip-hop cultures. On the other hand, the West Coast had developed an inferiority complex, as they felt overlooked and underestimated. By the late 1980s, however, the West Coast hip-hop scene was flourishing, led by acts such as N.W.A. from Compton, California. Their raw and unapologetic style resonated with audiences, and they became a force to be reckoned with in the industry. This newfound success only fueled the rivalry between the coasts, as the West Coast artists aimed to prove themselves against the perceived dominance of the East Coast. In 1991, the tension between the coasts reached a boiling point when Bronx rapper Tim Dogg released his album Penicillin on Wax. The album contained several skits that mocked West Coast artists, particularly the members of N.W.A., including Dr. Dre. One track in particular, titled Compton, took direct aim at the West Coast scene. This diss track, although not directly related to the beef between Bad Boy and Death Row set the stage for what was to come. That same year, Suge Knight, a native of Compton and a Blood Gang member, co-founded Death Row Records in Los Angeles. Alongside Dr. Dre, Knight aimed to establish Death Row as a powerhouse in the West Coast hip-hop scene. Knight was among those in the West Coast hip-hop community who were irritated by the perceived condescension from the East Coast. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, a young Sean Combs had a vision of creating a New York-centered hip-hop label that would rival the dominance of the West Coast. In 1993, Combs founded 
founded Bad Boy Records. And the following year, the label's debut releases by Biggie and Long Island-based rapper Craig Mack became immediate critical and commercial successes. At this point, both Death Row and Bad Boy were making waves in the industry, but it was the personal lives of their star artists that would ignite the feud. In 1994, New York-born, California-based rapper Tupac Shakur had released two successful albums and starred in three movies. However, his career was in jeopardy as he faced financial struggles and stood trial in New York City on charges of sexual abuse, sodomy, and weapons possession. On November 30th, 1994, a pivotal event occurred that would forever change the course of the beef between Bad Boy and Death Row. Tupac was scheduled to record a verse with Little Sean at Quad Studios in Manhattan to help pay his mounting legal fees. As he arrived at the studio, members of Junior Mafia, a group affiliated with Bad Boy, shouted greetings to Tupac from the street below. Unbeknownst to Tupac, danger awaited him inside the building. Once inside the studio, two gunmen ordered everyone in the lobby to the floor. Tupac hesitated, and in that moment, he was shot five times and robbed. As he was taken out on a stretcher, Tupac gave the middle finger to Biggie and other Bad Boy affiliates who were present. This incident would become a turning point in the beef, as Tupac implied in an interview that Biggie and Puff were involved in or responsible for the attack at Quad Studios. You don't know who shot me in your fucking hometown from your neighborhood? He owe me more than to turn his head and act like he didn't know. Tried to blow my fucking head off. He knew. Between the time of the interview and its publication, Puff Daddy visited Tupac at Rikers Island and assured him that Bad Boy was not involved in the shooting. However, the damage had been done and Tupac's trust in his former friends was shattered. The events at Quad Studios, coupled with the perceived similarities between Biggie's album and Tupac's upcoming release, fueled the fire of animosity between the two artists and their respective record labels. In February 1995, a B-side track from Biggie's Big Papa single was released. The track was titled, Who Shot Ya? And although Biggie and Puff Daddy Daddy denied any connection to the shooting at Quad Studios, Tupac interpreted the song as a direct taunt aimed at him. The lyrics and timing of the release only fueled Tupac's belief that Biggie and Bad Boy were involved in the attack. As the feud continued to gain momentum, the tension between the East Coast and West Coast hip-hop scenes reached a boiling point at the 1995 Source Awards in New York City. Suge Knight, the co-founder of Death Row Records, took the stage and made a bold statement that further ignited the rivalry. Any artists out there want to be an artist, and want to stay a star, and don't want to, don't want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the videos, all on the record, dancing. Woo! That was a direct shot at Puff Daddy, who had a habit of appearing in his artists' videos and music. Tensions were high that night as the crowd responded with booze. The East Coast don't love Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. The East Coast ain't got no love for Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Death Row. Y'all don't love us. Y'all don't love us. Well, let it be known then. However, P. Diddy took the stage, and instead of clapping back at Death Row, he extended an olive branch. He delivered a message of unity and called for an end to the East Coast versus West Coast divide. I'm the executive producer that a comment was made about a little bit earlier. But con check this out. Contrary to what other people may feel, I would like to say that I'm very proud of Dr. Dre, of Death Row, and Shook Knight for their accomplishments. And all this east and west that need to stop. However, Puff Daddy's plea for peace fell on deaf ears, as the feud had taken on a life of its own. The tension in the room was palpable, and it was clear that the feud between Bad Boy and Death Row had transcended the personal beef between Tupac and Biggie. The divide between the coasts was becoming more pronounced, and artists and fans were taking sides. The crowd booed again when Dr. Dre was named Producer of the Year. These public denouncements and confrontations only added fuel to the fire. The media sensationalized the feud, and fans eagerly awaited the next diss track or verbal jab from either side. The East Coast versus West Coast rivalry had become a spectacle, with the entire hip-hop community caught up in the drama. The problems between Bad Boy and Death Row continued outside of award shows and into the streets. In the following month, Suge Knight and Puff Daddy attended a birthday party for musician Jermaine Dupri at Platinum House Club in Atlanta. Conflict between the two groups spilled outside the club, and Big Jake Robles, a close friend of Knight's and a Death Row Blood affiliate, was fatally shot as he was getting into a limousine. Knight accused Puff Daddy of being involved in the shooting, further escalating the tensions between the two camps. Newsweek magazine reports this week on what it says is a growing feud between East Coast rap mogul Puffy Combs and West Coast titan Suge Knight. Shortly after Big Jake's death, Suge Knight took action to further solidify Death Row's alliance with Tupac. Knight secured Tupac's release from prison by posting his $1.4 million bond. He flew across the country and rented a limousine to pick up 
Tupac from Clinton Correctional Facility. With Tupac now a free man, he wasted no time in joining Knight and escalating the feud with Bad Boy Records. All these weak rappers, Nas, all these suckers, they battling off the of East and West like this is a game. This ain't no game. If this was chess, we'd be yelling checkmate. Tupac unleashed a series of diss tracks aimed at Biggie, Bad Boy, and their affiliates. Songs like the infamous Hit Em Up were filled with venomous lyrics and threats. Tupac's lyrics were shocking and explicit, leaving no doubt about his anger and desire for revenge. In response to Tupac's attacks, Bad Boy artists and their affiliates also fired back. Queens group Mob Deep, who had been called out by name in Tupac's Hit Em Up, released a track called Drop a Gem on him in August 1996 as a direct response. The diss tracks and public denouncements continued to escalate, with each side trying to outdo the other in their displays of aggression. The beef between Bad Boy Records and Death Row Records had reached a point of no return. The escalating tensions, public denouncements, and diss tracks had created an atmosphere of hostility and animosity that would ultimately lead to a tragic end. On September 7, 1996, the feud reached its peak of disaster. Tupac Shakur, the face of Death Row Records, was in Las Vegas for the Mike Tyson vs. Bruce Seldon boxing match. After the fight, Tupac and his entourage got into a physical altercation with a member of a rival gang. This incident only added fuel to the fire of the already heated feud. Later that night, as Tupac and his crew were driving through the streets of Las Vegas, a white Cadillac pulled up alongside their car. Gunshots rang out, and Tupac was struck multiple times. He was rushed to the hospital, where he fought for his life for six days before succumbing to his injuries on September 13, 1996. Tupac Shakur underwent a third operation last night to correct internal complications stemming from the drive-by shooting. He remains in the intensive care unit at University Medical Center in Las Vegas. He's undergone uh, two series of surgeries. He's had a right lung removed, and he remains in critical condition. The loss of Tupac sent shockwaves through the hip-hop community and marked a tragic turning point in the beef between Bad Boy and Death Row. And only a few months later, Biggie was also shot and killed. The gangster rap world has been shaken again, this time by the violent death of the performer known as Notorious B.I.G. The rapper was rushed to Cedar sinai Medical Center. He was pronounced dead a short time later. The legacy of the beef between Bad Boy Records and Death Row Records is a cautionary tale, a reminder of the destructive power of feuds and rivalries. It serves as a stark reminder that the pursuit of power and dominance can have devastating consequences. If you enjoyed this video, click on the boxes playing on your screen to watch similar content.